Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as uh, prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a fascinating series on the book of Revelation. This is lesson number 11 in that series, entitled The Seven Last Plagues. It's the lesson for March 16 of 2019, and I hope you know all about the last plagues. In fact, I wish you could be here to help us. We'll struggle through some of this. There's some challenging stuff here. But we, as always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, you know exactly what you had in mind when you gave these messages to your friend John. We wish that uh, we could understand or, uh, or know just exactly what he understood. But now we live at a time when many of these things have already taken place. So there's additional information, and we have the additional insights from Ellen White. We're thankful for all of that, but there's still many questions we would like to have answered. Be with us now as we talk together and discuss together the issues in, in these chapters that we may represent you correctly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Revelation 15 and especially 16 describe what are known as the seven last plagues. And as has been suggested by a lot of scholars, Revelation is end-oriented. What do we mean when we say end-oriented? We mean the most important part of the story is what happens at the end. And so we, we notice something very fascinating. Look at the first few verses of, of Revelation 15. Then I saw in the sky another mysterious sight, great and amazing. There were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last ones, because they are the final expression of God's anger. Then I saw what looked like. Now, you would expect, after an introduction like that, what would he? Sh he should just go immediately and tell us about the plagues, right? But he doesn't. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast in its image and over the one whose name was represented by a number. They were standing by the sea of glass, holding harps that God had given them and singing the song of Moses, the song of God and the song of the Lamb. Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds, King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord? Who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because your just actions are seen by all. So what's he doing here? He's saying, before you panic about the seven last plagues, let me tell you, there's going to be <laughs> some faithful people who are going to be standing beside the sea of glass next to God's throne through the other end of this. So let me just give you the good news before we jump into the bad news, okay? So what else is happening as we prepare for these seven last plagues? Well, we go to the next four verses. After this, I saw the temple in heaven open with the sacred tent in it. The seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, dressed in clean shining linen and with gold belts tied around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven gold bowls full of the anger of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory and power of God, and no one could go into the temple until the seven plagues brought by the seven angels had come to an end. Okay, so what do we normally understand is happening in the temple in heaven? Intercession. Intercession, yeah, okay, that's, that's the story of the temple, yeah, exactly. So why would the temple be empty? Intercession had ceased. Intercession is over. That's yeah. possible. My question is, how come you have all these people standing on the sea of glass before the plagues are introduced? Well, that's what I was just talking about when I said end-oriented. Yeah, so okay. the, 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 the what's John, what God is saying to John, don't panic. Not everybody's going to die. Things are going to get bad, but a group of people are going to be faithful and they're going to stand on the sea of glass when it's all over. So we've heard of a flashback. This is a flash forward yeah. for John, evidently, mm -hmm. if we take it that way. Yep. Well, it's all flash forward. Yeah. Some is just flashed 
further <laughs> forward yeah. than others. Well, that's yeah. starting with verse 2 there. Yeah. Sea of glass, after we've got the angels ready before they've mm -hmm. come to this earth. So, it's important to notice that no one is in the temple in heaven when these plagues fall. This means that the events connected with the seven last plagues ta will pl take place after the close of probation. But the most important question to ask about the seven last plagues is, who is the one that causes those seven last plagues? Now, it should be obvious if you read those first few verses because it says these seven angels come forward out of the temple of heaven and so forth and they're carrying God's wrath and that should be straightforward, right? So let's ask some questions. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just asking you to think about it. Which verse tells us that the temple was empty? Verse 8. 15 verse 8. 15 verse 8. Mm -hmm. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God for and no one could enter the temple. Yeah, but it doesn't say empty. It doesn't say empty, does no. it? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, think about that. That's one of the questions. Oh. Because the angels come from it. Yeah. And what is the purpose? So what does it mean no one could enter? Literally no one? Does that mean not even God himself? And what is the purpose of having seven plagues if probation is closed and no one will change his or her mind? An important verse to look at in connection with the seven last plagues is Revelation eleven eighteen. 18. Look at that really quick. The heathen were filled with rage because the time for your anger has come. And that's what we're talking about now. The time for the dead to be judged. The time has come to reward your saints, the prophets, and all your people, and all who have reverence for you, great and small alike. The time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Hmm, who would that be? Wow. Well, the group of people described in Revelation 15, 1 to 4 will be victorious over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. What does that tell you? Has anybody received the mark of the beast yet? No. We learned that in our previous lessons, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So it means that these people standing by the sea of glass in heaven are standing on the sea of glass, one or the other, are going to be a group of people who are going to come up there after who lived through the final events in this earth's history, presumably. And those people can't be the main recipients of the seven last plagues, for sure. Well, what do we learn? If we go back to Revelation 4 and 5, and even in this passage I just read, Revelation 15, 2 to 4, we read that all the beings around the throne of God, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, uh, and we, we, we discovered in previous lessons that 24 elders are likely human beings who were resurrected with Jesus. That's, at least that's one possibility. There's a hundred million angels standing around the throne of God, and they're all praising God for these seven last plagues. Are they? How could that possibly be true? They're praising God for the plagues. So are Would they, they praising be? God for the plagues or are they praising Him for some other reason? Well, that's what we need to ask. Would they, would they be, because if you just read 15, just straightforward, it sounds like God sends out these angels and they're going to wipe out God's enemies. Do you think they would be praising God if God had just spent a bunch of time wiping out His enemies? I'm just asking. I'm trying to see in mind. So why even go through the great controversy? Because he could have ended it long time ago. Exactly. If God was just going to wipe out his energy en enemies at some point in time, he should have done that with Satan back and, at the beginning. And Jesus <laughs> didn't need to die. And well, we he know needed to, hmm? the, he needed to build the kingdom. So, uh, you know, like he says uh, in. Uh, Peter, uh, he's not willing that any should perish. perish, but that all should come to repentance. repentance. So, the, you know, as time goes on, there's more souls for the kingdom, so to speak. It's not well, like we pre-existed yeah, and true. then came down here into these bodies, uh, or we could have been 
But if you take that there. argument, yeah, if you take that argument to a logical conclusion, he should never come because there's always going to be a few more people, at least a few more, that would would join. Depends. Depends on whether there can be people. Part of the sin process is that they can reach a point where they can no longer respond. Unless the Holy Spirit is withdrawn where they don't have anyone they're listening to. Let's jump yeah. back to Revelation 7 for a couple minutes. Revelation 7, 1 to 3. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or any against any tree. Does this mean they're preventing the seven last plagues? And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I was told that the number of those who are marked with God's seal on their foreheads was 144,000. Okay, so apparently marking is going to have to happen and sealing is going to have to happen before these final plagues take place, right? Right. Well, what do we know about the plagues themselves? I can read what it says there in Revelation 16, but we have a, pre a, a preamble, don't we? Exodus 7 to 11, we don't have time to read all that, but those are the, that's the ten plagues that fell on Egypt. And Paul <coughs> Wright tells us something about that. Uh, Dennis? What do you okay, have there? Okay, this is from the Great Controversy, uh, page 627, uh, paragraph 3. Then Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary. The unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in Revelation 14, 9 and 10 will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when, when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more, to those more yeah. terrible and extensive judgments which are about to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. By condemning the people of God to death, they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if they had been shed by their hands, as if it had been shed by their hands. In like manner, Christ declared the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of holy men who had been shed since the days of Abel. For they possessed the same spirit and were seeking to do the same work with these murderers and prophets. Murderers of the prophets. Wow, Great Controversy 627. Okay, it's interesting. We suggested this when we were talking about the seven trumpets back in Revelation 10 and 11, that they are somewhat parallel to the seven last plagues. But those events happened earlier in Christian history. These last plagues will occur after the close of probation. And so what is, this, is, what is the result of the seven last plagues? Revelation 16 verse 11 tells us, And they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not turn from their evil ways. So what is happening around God's throne? Has God finally lost his temper? Anybody think God loses his temper? No. No. Has he become so upset some that he... Some people do. Some, yeah. A lot of people do. But we don't. <laughs> has he become so upset that he just has to destroy his enemies? No. I don't think so. If God were inclined to do that, shouldn't he have destroyed Lucifer when he first sinned in heaven? So we have some passages in the Bible, and I'm not going to read all of this, but there's a very interesting passage in Romans 1, verses 18, I'm, and I'm going to drop down and we're going to... Romans 1.18 says, and this is interesting because Paul says, let me tell you about the good news. And what's the first thing he talks about? God's anger. Now that seems really strange to us. He says, God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. And I, we don't have time to read all the verses in between. So what does God do? Look at verse 24. And so God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. And then in verse 26, because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. In verse 28, 
because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over. So at the end of time, these people are absolutely determined to do everything against God. So what does he do? He's Sounds like he's giving them up. He lets them have their way. Uh, my question is, if uh, why, th because probation has already closed when the the plan the plagues are passed. Plagues are if all yeah, um, the people are not going to be turning. There's no way they c they can even turn back to God. They just curse God. Well, okay, but we we're going to see later in this lesson that each person has already made up his own mind. So God has, doesn't have to do it. He's not, he's not saying, well, you, you, you're gone and I like you or something like that. No. He, they, each person's already made up. God just seals people. you either sealed for God or you're sealed for the devil. And that's already happened. So why are we sure that probation has closed before the seven last plagues fall? Well, one suggestion is because there's no action going on in the, in the sanctuary in heaven. And the, and the idea would be that God and the angels and the 24 elders and the four living creatures have all departed from heaven and on their way down here to the earth for the second coming. That's a possibility. Back in 14, we have the white cloud and the mm -hmm. reaping and, and, and yeah. that's all descriptive of the, uh, the harvest. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White says in a certain place that uh, uh, the wheat and tares grow together, this is in yeah. Christ's lot object, yeah. to, to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the close of probationary time. Mm -hmm. So we usually see, because Jesus is seated on a cl cloud, see this is the end, this is the second coming, we think. And then we have to double back with, if, with the seven last plagues. But but it doesn't have to be because he's on a cloud going in Daniel 7 going to receive the kingdom and he's certainly when he leaves there he's on a cloud and then he also would be on a cloud when we see him so he's not changing mm -hmm. uh, the well, way he's moving. Yeah. The revelation is not chronologic. It's one of the things that I've picked up. Okay. Well, it's, okay, it jumps he, around. Okay, yes, mm -hmm. the storyline progresses, but it 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 I mean it, it picks up something and it comes back, it, but it always comes back to the storyline. I mean, we make we have a general progression from John's day to the third coming, basically. So there is a general storyline. But there's a lot of movement jumping around. around. That's yeah. right, and including I would say Revelation this, 14 going back to the very beginning, mm -hmm. where there's sin in heaven. Mm -hmm. Revelation right. 12. 12, I'm sorry. Do we have any uh, extra insight from Ellen White on exactly where the close of probation comes? Compared That's to the what place? I just said. Yeah. Uh, the harvest is. is the close of probationary time. That's what she says. And this, is, this is, uh, seems to be the harvest. Well, and, and, and it's very clear in a number of places, Ellen White says, God will not come until everybody has made up their mind. So either you either get marked or sealed before a close of probation takes place. Uh, the other purpose, oh. No good. The other purpose of this would be a demonstration that yes, indeed, people have reached a point where they aren't going to switch sides. Well, there's a, there's, there's a very important reason I want to get to in a moment. So hang on. God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own destructive choices. And that's clear from the book of Hosea, Hosea 4.17 especially, and Hosea 11.7-8. And for those, if you want to get our handout, if you want a lot more information on this, go to our website, look for the handout on God's wrath or anger, and if you get our, if you get our, our if you look our, up at our website, It'll pop up right there for you. Just hit the hit the the key right there. Um, it'll give you a lot more information. So, <clears throat> what's this business about nobody in the temple? Do we have any previous examples of that? Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. When the sanctuary tent was finished out there at the foot of Mount Sinai, 
the, the, the fact that it was finished was signaled by the fact that God's presence came down, filled the temple, and not even Moses could go in. And then when Solomon finished his temple, that's Exodus 40, verses 34. Well, let me just read that. I, we, we're probably going to run out of time, but... Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent. I mean, this is Moses who had spent weeks in the very presence of God. Um, and then we come to the story of, of Solomon's dedication of his tent, his, the big Jerusalem temple. And as the priests were leaving the temple, this is 1 Kings 8, verses 10 and 11, it was suddenly filled with a cloud, of course, shining with the dazzling light of the Lord's presence, and they could not go back in to perform their duties. So there's two examples suggesting that when a certain major step has been accomplished, man, God does something, and there's no one in the temple for a while. When the most important events of those dedications were finished, the priests left the temple and God's presence filled it. How should this be compared with Revelation 15, 5 to 8, where we just read? But Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary will not end until every person living on earth has made her or his decision as to which side she or he is going to belong. Christ will never arbitrarily close probation. Carrie? Yes, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. And all the angelic hosts laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case had been decided for life or death. And that comes... comes from Early Writings, page 279, paragraph 2 through 280. Okay. That's when permission closes right there. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He says, exactly. it's done. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's done. The censor mm -hmm. is not here. I'm not here to help you. And see, then the Holy Spirit's no longer there, so no one's Yeah, listening. but the reason it's possible to close at that point is because everybody has made up their mind down here on planet Earth. God just records the fact. Have we heard it is done before? Yes. yes. On the cross, obviously. It is finished, yes. It is finished. Perhaps mm -hmm. it's similar in the mm -hmm. Greek. And the dead Arabic. from all ages have already been judged. <laughs> yeah. So these are the living his, people. His work on earth was done. Yeah. Now his work in heaven Dr. is Hart, done. Dr. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask, are, is proportion closed by some folk on this earth right now who have made up their mind and they will not change? Does that happen? It's just like Holy Spirit falls on it's, people it's at different possible. times? It's possible. It's possible. I obviously know, have no way of knowing that. I'm not the judge, but God will know that. Yeah. Well, look at Revelation 16. Now, that's right in the middle of our plagues. Yes. There are some people who are so settled into the way that they are that they can't be moved. And Jack Bravancha used to talk about the, uh, you know, the bank robber who mm -hmm. goes by the bank and, you know, he has to rob that bank. Yeah. And he said the bank robber is set in his ways that way. He said that he didn't have the same urges. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his temptations were different. Okay. Well, look at the fourth. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to burn people at its fiery heat. They were bur burnt by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God with, who has authority over these plagues. But they would not turn from their sins and praise His greatness. So, the question is, if we read down below, the next plague is, they did not turn from their evil ways. Verse 11. So, what is this telling us? Nobody's going to change their mind when these plagues fall out. These verses make it very obvious that after the close of probation, each person's character will be set when the fourth and fifth plagues will be poured out upon the earth. The wicked refuse to give up their sins or change in any way. They simply curse God. Now, 
For a brief period of time after the close of probation, God will finally allow Satan to have full sway on this earth. But he will not be permitted to destroy any of God's faithful people. But destroying God's faithful people is exactly what Satan wants to do. I mean, think about it. What Satan really would like to do is just destroy all of God's people. Either tell God, just take your people and get out of here. Leave this earth to me and my people. Or let me destroy them. I'll destroy them if I can get to them. And what does God say? No way. Not going to allow it. He doesn't care about his people. Satan doesn't care about his people. But he would love to destroy God's people. In his anger and fury, Satan does his work. Okay, Margaret? These plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off. Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. The people of God will not be free from suffering, but while persecuted and distressed, while they endure privation and suffer for want of food, they will not be left to perish. That God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. He who numbers the hairs of their head will care for them, and in time of famine they shall be satisfied. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence, angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. To him that walketh righteously is the promise, bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. When the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the Lord God of Israel, will not forsake them. That's beautiful. That's from Isaiah 33, 15 mm -hmm. and 16, 41, 15 and 16, wait a minute, Isaiah 33, 15, 15 and, 16. and 16 and 41, 17. Yet to, the human, yet to the human sight, it will appear that the people of God must soon seal their testimony with their blood as did the martyrs before them. They themselves begin to fear that the Lord has left them to fall by the hand of their enemies. It is a time of fearful agony. Day and night they cry unto God for deliverance. Like Jacob, all are wrestling with God. Their countenances, countenances express their internal struggle. Paleness sits upon every face, yet they cease not their earnest intercession. This is often a great controversy, mm -hmm. and it's an amazing word picture. It's really mm -hmm. descriptive. Could men see with heavenly vision, they would behold companies of angel, angels that excel in strength, stationed about those who have kept the word of Christ's patience. With sympathizing tenderness, angels have witnessed their distress and have heard their prayers. They are awaiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril, but they must wait yet a little longer. The people of God must drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism. The very delay so painful to them is the best answer to their petitions. As they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, and patience, which have been too little exercised during their religious experience. Yet for the elect's sake, the time of trouble will be shortened. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. I was surprised to see that was Luke 18, 7 yeah. and 8. Seems like that's coming from Revelation of the Old Testament. <laughs> exactly. The end will come more quickly than men expect. The wheat will be gathered and bound in sheaves for the garner of God. The tares will be bound as faggots for the fires of destruction. That's Great Controversy 628. Okay, so now let's ask ourselves, what is happening here? Why is this necessary? Final, final polishing. The final polishing. Why do we need that? Why I mean, not? we're, we're going to live in a world and a universe where there's no trouble, there's no problems. 
no one to tamp the water. So why do we need a final polishing like this? We haven't vindicated the ways of God yet. Okay, what do we mean by that? We have not yet lived to the standard of the truth as we find it in the message of Jesus all the way to the cross. Okay. Remember that Satan managed to get a third of the angels to join him because he promised them that he could run a better world, a better universe than God did. And they, they bought that lie. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and that's a third that actually committed to him. A lot of the others, Ellen White said, were undecided but stayed with God for the time. Yep. So how would you find out? How, how would that find? Well, what's happened in the history of our world is Satan said, anybody who comes to planet Earth, this is my territory. Anybody who comes here will sin. He will be a sinner and he will be mine. And Jesus came and he lived a perfect life <clears throat> and he died that awful death and he did not sin. And then Satan's response was, well, but, you know, Jesus isn't an ordinary human being. He's special, you know, he, he's God and all that kind of stuff. But Satan never, has he even till this day, uh, understood that he really just is a creature? <laughs> Why would he I want mean, to he, admit that? Well, he doesn't understand, uh, at least from our perspective, he doesn't understand that he's dependent upon the Creator for his very exis- existence. And uh, there, there's a couple of t- passages here. We got uh, uh, Psalms 82 and uh, Jeremiah 10:11, t- telling them they're going to die like humans. Well, he's seen thousands of years of humans dying like humans, mm-hmm. and those. Well, and all this stuff we're reading, he's got it memorized. I mean, it's, well, uh, maybe it's got selective memory, or maybe his <laughs> ran, uh, uh, ROM is He's not insane. working properly. Th- yeah, that's no the only way you can answer it. Yeah. No, it's, well, it's, it's, it's pride. Insanity. It's pride that has yeah. gone to the extreme. And pride causes well, insanity. Okay, so God says, okay, you think Jesus is just an exemption. And there have been some Job's and there have been some Moseses and so forth who've done pretty well. And God says, just wait. At the end of this world's history, under the very worst possible circumstances, I'm going to have a whole group who are going to worship me and and be faithful to me and love me because they want to love me. And and nothing you can do, Satan, is going to be able to stop them. And Satan says, it'll never happen. So that's why all this trouble comes to God's faithful. The end, even though it's after probation is closed. Just watch me. Just watch me. So we're not doing this for us. No. Well, it's for the benefit of the whole universe. The universe yeah. yeah. If you understand something about conditions on this, this earth, you recognize that life cannot exist if these plagues are universal. For example, life on land cannot exist for long if everything in the sea dies. Most of the oxygen we breathe comes from micros- microscopic plants that live in the ocean. Now, I don't know whether. When she talks about everything in the ocean dies, the Bible talks about everything in the ocean dies. Does that include all the microscopic plants? I don't know. The planktons. The planktons. So we ask once again, is it really God who's doing this? No, God is just allowing it so we can see how things would be if the devil were in charge. Well, starting in Revelation 12, we've seen a lot of cooperation between Satan the sea beasts, the land beasts, and also governments and businesses that have benefited from that relationship. But as these plagues are spreading, the fifth plague strikes the throne of the beast. When people realize that the one they have been worshiping cannot even protect his or her own throne, they turn against him or her. Well, can we maintain so close a walk with the Lord that no matter what happens, we stay faithful? Well, look what happens next. Revelation 16. Actually, I'm going to read you Revelation 15 and 16. I mean, not 15. I'm going to read you the fifth and sixth plagues. Look at uh, Revelation 16, starting with verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now, obviously the devil, this is his, his headquarters, right? And he should be protecting it, right? 
Darkness fell over the beast kingdom and people bit their tongues because of their pain. Now, I'm not sure what is the relationship between darkness and pain. And they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not turn from their evil ways. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. The river dried up to provide a way for the kings who come from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. So would God be sending three unclean spirits? Don't think so. No, These three spirits... from those, the beast, the, yeah. the dragon. Yeah, and who's behind that? These three spirits go out to all the kings of the earth to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. So what's the purpose of all this? Satan is determined to do what? Satan's determined to kill God's <coughs> people, but God won't let him. Uh, and even God himself will be good. Yeah. Well, in ancient times, the river Euphrates watered the kingdoms of Assyria and Babylon. These two nations were Israel's worst enemies. Today, however, so much of the water from the Euphrates is siphoned off for irrigation, and that's true of the Jordan River as well, that the Euphrates is not much of a river anymore. Is that what it means by the drying up of the river? Or might it have a different symbolic kind of meaning? Symbolic. Well, look at Revelation 17, the first verse and verse 15. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, and I will show you how the famous prostitute is to be punished. That great city that is built near many rivers. <clears throat> And then verse 15, the angel also said to me, the waters you saw in which the prostitute is sitting are nations, peoples, races, and languages. So in the, re <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, we believe that waters represent what? People. People. A lot of people. Wouldn't that suggest that the drying up of the rivers of the Euphrates is talking about worldwide civil, secular, and political powers which have up to that point stood behind Satan's system or supported his system? To see what happened to the Old Testament when Babylon deteriorated, look at Jeremiah 51, 13, and I'll read that to you. The, that country has many rivers and rich treasures, but its time is up and its thread of life is cut. And what do we know about the destruction of Babylon? The river was dried up. <coughs> yeah, they dried up the river and they came. In a matter of a few hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What actually happened was Cyrus came out of the east and north. He came down under the plague with his big army and the people in Babylon thought, you know, this guy's just wasting his time. There's no way he can get in here. They had walls that were like some places like 40, 50 feet thick and gates, iron gates that hung down quite a ways into the water of the, even though the river went through the city, there's no way that anybody can get there. So Cyrus and his gang dug a big old reservoir close to the river without breaking the, with the wall. And then when they were ready to conquer the, 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 the city of Babylon, they knocked open that spot and the whole river just went off into this reservoir temporarily. And while the river was going off into the reservoir, the river level, of course, under the gates, sunk way down and Cyrus's army just marked, marched right under those iron gates, walked up, went up to the middle part of the city. And if you read the history, the people in Babylon were so sure that Nobody could possibly ever get in there. They didn't even close. There were no guards even at the inside gates, the one next to the river inside. And Cyrus just marched in. And the big bosses were drunk that night. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. Must have been, not been in a rainy season. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Cyrus took the, the city of Babylon by complete surprise. So just as ancient Babylon was taken by surprise, something similar will happen to modern Babylon. Gordon? This is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. As the people of the world witness the upheaval in nature, uh, see Revelation 16, 3 through 9, they turn to Babylon for protection. However, as the fifth plague strikes the seat of Babylon's authority, they see the futility of seeking help there. Feeling deceived, they turn against Babylon, causing her downfall. Yet, as we have seen, their hearts remain hard against God. 
and his people. As such, they become fertile soil for the final deception by which Satan will draw the world to unite against God's people to wipe them off the face of the earth. That's exactly what Satan would like to do. So, we're suggesting then that the drying up the Euphrates is a symbol for the loss of support for Satan and his immoral associates at the very end of time. And Revelation says clearly that these people will turn against... Uh, maybe we, do, uh, maybe we need... I've got a great text from New Revised Standard. Okay. They and the beast will hate the whore. Yeah. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Exactly. That's pretty descriptive. That's verse yeah. 16, chapter yeah. 17. That's what I was just going to go to. Very good. So these people who have been supporting the devil and all his machinations here, all his beasts, all of a sudden said, these people aren't helping us. They're not, they're not accomplishing what we need. Nobody, who's protecting us? And they turn on her and they just destroy her. Well, when Cyrus conquered ancient Babylon, he soon gave the children of Israel permission to go back to their homeland. Unfor Remember the, in Isaiah and um, in Jeremiah it says, prophecies in advance. Um, Cyrus, my agent. God says, Cyrus is my agent. He's going to let my people go back home. And he did. Almost immediately after he took over, he said, you people from Israel, if you want to go back to your place, you can. But hardly anyone did. Only a, unfortunately, only a very small number of them did. So when the modern day Babylon loses its support, Christ will advance with his army of heavenly angels to take the righteous home to heaven. Pretty clear parallel. Well, look at Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. We already read this. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. The battle of the great day of Almighty God. Hmm. Like, what do we call that battle? Armageddon. 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 While God's faithful people are spreading the gospel as portrayed in the three angels' messages, Satan's unholy trinity will be spreading his gospel of animos animosity against God. The dragon, operating through forms of paganism and spiritualism, cooperating with the sea beast, operating as Roman Catholicism, and the false prophet, which we now understand represents apostate Protestantism, will unite under Satan's command, Revelation 13, 11, 12. Unfortunately, the majority of people on this earth, blinded by their hatred of God and his people, whom they think are responsible for the plagues, remember that? The, the Satan will convince people that it's God's people are responsible for the plagues that are falling. They will believe Satan's lies and join his side in the final battle against God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. I'm going to... I think we have time to read that. Let me just read that. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders. So Satan's going to be doing miracles and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. And so God sends the power of error to work in them so that they believe what is false. The result is that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in sin will be condemned. This could be happening in mega churches all over the world. Well, Armageddon. There's been a great discussion, a deal of discussion about Armageddon down through the years. The first question to be asked is, what or where is Armageddon? Well, the Hebrew word breaks down into two words, har, which means mountain, and Magadon, which could mean Megiddo, or possibly a word meaning a place of assembly. But there is no place called the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo is a small hill located in the middle of the valley of Jezreel, or the plain of Esdraelon, depending on which side you're looking at, not too far from Mount Carmel near the Mediterranean coast. That area was known for many decisive battles in Israel's history. Joshua fought one there, Judges 5, Again, Judges 6, 2 Kings, uh, Elijah, well, there's, there's, anyway, there's, 
If you get our hand out, it's all lifted there. Some have suggested, since there is no Mount Megiddo, that possibly this is an allusion to Mount Carmel, where Elijah had, had that showdown recorded in 1 Kings 18. And what happened in Elijah's showdown? Well, Remember? demonstration of who was really God. Yep. You know, so here's one someone. person, uh, uh, and just imagine that, standing, I've, I've had the privilege of visiting that spot. Here's one man standing, and here's 850 opponents there. And he says, okay, you guys, go ahead. You have the first chance. All you have to do is get your God to bring down fire from heaven to burn up your sacrifice. Here's your altar. There's the wood. There's the animal. Go for it. And, of course, what do you think they, they thought? Well, they thought this is going to be no problem. They, they figured somebody yeah. would be able to slip fire in somehow or other. I mean, imagine 850 people dancing around an altar. Plus visible. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how, how could you possibly keep yeah. them, somebody from doing something? Oh, yeah. It's just, yeah. What happened? Well, after about six or eight hours of trying to get their thing to burn, it didn't. Maybe they tried, but well, Elijah I'm, put I'm water on it. Somebody watching. <laughs> I suspect that the good Lord was there to make sure that no no fire got on that, <laughs> in that into that yes. wood. God, so and, God's the fireman, huh? Yeah. And so what did Elijah do? He says, "Well, okay, let's build up the altar here. Pull we'll put on the wood. We'll put on the sacrifice. Uh, bring some water. Yeah. Twelve buckets. Pour it on here." Let's build it's a trench. It's been for a long time. I'm saying, where did they get this water? Well, it's only a little ways down to the Mediterranean. Is it so they can I, carry it up? I think they must have carried it up. I don't know where else they would have gotten water. Well, and so Elijah prays, and you know what happened. Fire came down from heaven and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the water, left a black hole in the ground. Isn't that one of our all-time favorite Bible stories? Mm -hmm. When you look back, Mm -hmm. As a little kid growing up reading Bible stories, yeah. that stands out. David and Goliath, Elijah and the fire. Yeah. So, so when, 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 when Elijah Ooh. got done with that experience, was he uh, any, uh, I mean, you don't see a, a codicil to it that, uh, well, well done there, uh, Elijah. Because no. Elijah took off uh, running down to... Well, the interesting story, of course, is that Jezebel came over to Israel as an evangelist. Right. She was determined that she was going to get the country of Israel, all of them, to worship Baal. So what did Elijah do at the end of this experience? Scared. <laughs> Running. <laughs> well, before he ran, he and the, his helpers killed all 850 of her priests. Either that or they turned against each other. <laughs> well, whatever. 850 is a lot. He should have been <laughs> retired. Yeah. Well, he he shouldn't have been able to run that. So God didn't say, well done, no. Elijah. Huh? No, the Bible doesn't say that. Well, is this question about who is the real God, is that the question to be answered in our day? Yes. Yes. Well, look at Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17. <clears throat> what, will, what will happen to these people who, are, who have been followers of, God, of the Satan? Then the kings of the earth, the rulers and the military chiefs, the rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. Their terrible day of their anger is, is here, and who can stand against it? So, when this is all over, what are they going to be doing? calling for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. Yeah. So Armageddon will not be some kind of military battle either in the Middle East or anywhere else on earth. It will be a spiritual battle over who is telling the truth and who can we trust. The weapons will be truth versus falsehood, love versus selfishness. So how can we possibly prepare ourselves for these final events prior to the second coming of Jesus? Fred? Well, none of those who have fortified the mind with the truth of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? 
The Apostle Paul declared, looking down to the last days, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, that time has fully come. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with the desires of the sinful, world-loving heart and Satan supplies the deceptions which they love. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils as numerous and discordant. <laughs> I have to chuckle when you read that, as discordant as they are. As they are. The churches will, um, the churches which they represent, the voices of the majority, not one, nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Very good. Jim? As the Cronian Act and the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The Church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as a consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. Revelation 1, 13-15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. And you try to imagine in your eyes what that'll be. Mm. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him. While he lifts up his hands and pronounces blessings upon them, as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth, his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is a strong, almost overmastering delusion. Ellen White, Great Controversy, 593 to 595. So in Revelation 16, 15, what is God asking us to do? The white garments mentioned there are representative of the good works of God's people. We need to, be, to remain faithful. One of the things we have noticed is that God's faithful end time people are sometimes referred to as a remnant, sometimes 144,000, they're also called as saints. They will stand in the sea of glass because they have been chosen faithful followers of the Lamb. So why is it necessary for God's faithful people to go through this terrible time of trouble with their lives threatened if no one is going to change his or her mind? The final battle between God and Satan will be over who is telling the truth and should, who should be allowed to rule. Satan has always claimed that he can do a better job of ruling the, than God does. It was on that basis that he convinced so many angels to join him in his fight against God. Isaiah 14, 13 tells us that Satan has always wanted to sit on the Armageddon or Mount of Assembly in the far north where ancient peoples uh, believed the gods lived. So if you go to Isaiah 14, 13, you know a little bit of Hebrew, you can see right there the Har Magadon is straight from the Hebrew there. And it's the amount of assembly. And the ancient peoples believed that 
there was some place way up there in the north they called the Mount of Assembly, and they believed that's, of course, they believed in multiple gods, but this was the idea. This does, this does not refer to any real mountain. It is talking about Satan's desire to be like God and that he will be the basis, and that will be the basis of the final battle. It is interesting to note that in the middle of the plague describing the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, 13 to 16, there's a blessing for those who keep watching, hang on to, hang on to their clothes. Look at that really quick. Then I saw three unclean spirits. Um, but no, look at 15. I'm just, we don't have time here. Listen, I'm coming like a thief, happy as he who stands awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be ashamed in public. What is that talking about? Well, does this remind you of Revelation 3.18, Christ's warning to the church of Laodicea? Buy of me white garments. Yeah, right of robes of righteousness. When Christ says that he's coming like a thief, Revelation 16, 15, Matthew 24, 42 to 44, and Luke 12, and 1 Thessalonians, etc. What is he talking about? First of all, he's talking about the close of probation, which no one on earth will know about. In other words, nobody here on this earth will know when everyone has finally made up their minds and Satan's allowed, to, I mean, God is, is, is closed down uh, things in heaven and gets ready to come down here. But to most of the people of the world, even the second coming will be a total surprise. But there is no reason for God's Bible-studying people to be surprised. Why not? Already know. We have been warned. We have been warned in, in this book. And if you look at um, it's second, no, it's the, um, second Peter 5, he says... It's going to be a surprise. But then at the verse about 6 down there, he says, but it shouldn't be a surprise to you because you've been warned. You know what's, what's coming. Now, we don't know dates. We don't, we're not told this many hours or this many minutes or this many years. But we've told about the sequence of events. Are we paying attention to those sequence of events? Are we, do we have them clearly enough in mind so that as they happen, and when we, when we read about these final events and, and every island in the sea being destroyed and the mountains moved out of their place and, and this earthquake, of course, by then, it's, it's too late for anyone to change their mind. But uh, we want to be prepared way before that day comes. I hope you out there and those of us here have had a chance to think through these issues and have come to some good conclusions. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying these events to talk about your word and to learn something about what is coming in the future. May we be prepared is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.